Okay, I think All we're right. live. Okay, looks like we're live here, everybody. Welcome to our event for today. We're gonna hang out here for just a minute while we let folks join us here. And we'll get started in just about a minute. Looks like we got about 50 people here so far, which is great. <clears throat> Feel free to send me a message if any of my friends are out there. All right, I think we're gonna go ahead and kick it off here. It looks like we're stabilizing at about 70 people here joining us. So thanks everybody for, for being here. Um, so my name is Ian Davidson and I'm the Chief Business Development Officer at Segra. And uh, in case you're not familiar with what we do, uh, Segra is an ag tech, com ag tech company. We're based in Vancouver and we specialize in plant tissue culture, genomics, molecular biology and plant pathogen detection all really focused on cannabis. Um, so, you know, on behalf of our whole team, we want to thank you all for being here today. And a special thanks to Mojave Richmond and our chief science officer, Dr. John Brunstein for making time for this today. Um, so this talk is part of what we're calling our growth talk series. Um, and it's going to be an ongoing series with a focus uh, on providing a platform to explore science-based discussion related to cannabis. Uh, in collaboration with top industry experts. Um, we've got a number of additional growth talks in the pipeline right now, so stay tuned. And we'll be making announcements related to those here in the near future. Near future. Um, our next growth talk will be part two of a panel discussion uh, regarding the past, present, and future of cannabis breeding. We did part one on that one about a month ago, and it's available on our YouTube channel if you want to check that out. Um, and the part two is going to be all on the future. So part one touched on the past and the present, and then we'll be getting into the, uh, the juicy stuff related to the future breeding here on the next one. So stay tuned. We'll be announcing that date very soon. Um, and then uh, turning over to, the, to today's discussion. So today we're going to focus on a very timely topic in our industry being hop latent viroid and cannabis. Uh, we're going to start off today with Dr. John Brunstein sharing a brief presentation on the topic. Uh, and then Mojave will jump in to share some of his kind of boots on the ground experiences and uh, take us into the question and answer section session. Um, you know, with Dr. John Brunstein's uh, background, uh, his academic background as a virologist and uh, Mojave's many years of real world experience in the, in the industry, I think we should be in really good hands for a lively discussion. So um, with that, I am going to turn things over to Dr. John Brunstein and take it away. Okay, well, thank you, Ian. I hope uh, everyone can hear me okay and uh, see me. Lighting, I think, is not ideal. So we're, we're going to talk about hoplite and viroid today and uh, particularly some of the challenges, which I think everybody understands, uh, some of the mitigations, uh, what we think we can do about it now or what we think might be uh, avenues for better mitigation in the future and some future perspectives, which um, as I think we'll see to a large extent, we'll be trying to learn more information. Um, so again, as Ian said, just a quick reminder who we are, we're a cannabis ag tech company, primarily focused on tissue culture nursery. Um, so we do tissue culture of both our internal and uh, client cultivars, um, and it's very scalable, and we can uh, provide those uh, as needed to people and free up mother room space and provide uniform and hopefully uh, clean material. And as you heard, so this is part of a series of growth talks, and the one coming up will be the uh, part two, the past, present, and future of cannabis breeding um, late April. Okay. Um, and if you want to never miss an event, uh, push for our marketing folks here, all the different ways out in the uh, Twitterverse and other equivalent things that you can stay on top of when we're going to be doing these. So we will be signed up for those. Okay, uh, the panel today, as you've heard, is myself um, and Mojave Richmond coming at this from a different and I think complementary perspectives uh, to hopefully give a, as full a picture as we can of this issue. 
Okay, so the things we'd like to cover today, first off, what is hoplite and viroid? Um, what are some key differences between a viroid and a virus? Because those have implications um, in the real world. So how does that relate to control of hoplite and viroid spread? How does it relate to transmission? How can you test for the presence of hoplite and viroid? Uh, one of the things I'm going to be pushing a lot, and this comes out of my clinical background, is what doesn't a negative hoplite and viroid test tell you? So can you always trust that? What, is, what does it maybe mean or not mean? Can hoplite and viroid be cured? Um, and then some of the real rubber hits the road kind of issues of what's the economic damage uh, on the plants? How big of a problem is this in the industry? And then, you know, we'll turn this over to the more exciting part, which will be after we've gone through this kind of... Uh, baseline of information, opening it up for audience Q&A. And I believe the way that's going to work is people can uh, use the chat window to send questions to Ian, and he'll sort of curate through those and take the, the sort of uh, ones that look like of general interest and pass those on to myself and Mojave, and we'll do our best to answer them. Okay, let's start off with what is HLVD, so a, a portrait of it. Well, we've known about this for quite a while. It was discovered uh, in 1987. Uh, it has a narrow host range compared to most plant pathogens. It's known to infect hops, cannabis, and nettles. Hops and cannabis are very closely related, and nettles really isn't that far away. It's quite small. It's a circular, single-stranded RNA, which is, as you can see, it's palindromic. It likes to fold up on itself. It's only 256 nucleotides long. There is a fairly short conserved central region. Um, and it's a viroid, which we'll get to in a moment, which is going to, as I said, have implications for transmission and control. If you look in GenBank right now, there appear to be at least two genotypes of this. Um, and what else do we know? Well, something else that's important here, people have looked in hops at how much of this accumulates, and the answer is a lot. The numbers come out to around 240 million copies per milligram of fresh tissue, and that's going to have implications both for testing um, and for control issues, and we'll come to that later. So a key point, particularly for my part of the talk, is what I'm going to now stress right here. Most of what we know on the academic side of this is from hops. Hops is closely related to cannabis, but bear in mind uh, anything we're extrapolating from that um, is likely to be similar or true, but is not guaranteed to be true. There are almost certainly is going to be some differences in how these two hosts react to this. And I think we're already starting to be aware of some of those. Um, what we know in hops is a guideline for things that we should look for. Um, it's helpful, but it's not a be all and an end all. And there's a lot more about this pathogen that we don't know at this point than we do know. So um, we all have a lot to learn and this is a good place to start. Okay, so some quick, uh, signs of hoplite and viroid infection. And we'll get a little bit more to this later in the talk with some other photographs. But some here's some key points. In hops, one of the important things there is that it's really variable. And not all cultivars show significant impact of infection. And I think that's intriguing. And um, if it turns out that applies in cannabis as well, that's going to turn out to be important. Um, it's very common in hops. There was a, a published survey in Washington State, big hops growing region, and 98 out of 126 plants over a whole bunch of different cultivars were all positive for it. In hops, it's not really worried about too much because it's not generally of huge economic importance and you just kind of shrug your shoulders and move on and your hops plants grow okay. And we know certainly in cannabis, certainly in some cultivars, that's not the case. It's much more serious. So in cannabis, um, common signs of infection include uh, kind of a stunting or Christmas tree. And you can see some examples here. Ooh, I think I have a laser pointer thing. Here we go. So here's an infected plant stunted versus a healthy plant. Um, malformation or chlorosis of leaves. I'll show some examples of that later. Poor rooting, uh, brittle stems, uh, anecdotal reports of uh, leaves dropping off. And I think um, Mojave will be able to talk a little bit more about firsthand experience with this kind of thing. Reduction in yields, obviously what everybody really cares about. Um, I do think this is likely to be variable based on hops. Do all cultivars show symptoms? We already have some preliminary data suggesting some cannabis cultivars are either resistant to infection or resistant to actually showing any symptoms of infection, which from a cultivator perspective is very nearly as good. 
Uh, there may be environmental factors, other stressors may be needed to have an infected plant actually show symptoms. So maybe you can have an infected plant and it seems fine and then some other stressor triggers it. Um, and what are the implications of this? It's worth noting that the name, the latent part of the name comes from the fact that in hops, a lot of plants can be completely asymptomatic and then it is this stressor that brings this latent, this kind of sleeping infection out and uh, causes problems. Um, I'm just gonna point out here um, give credit where credit's due. The photograph here of the healthy versus the infected plants and the ones we'll show later were provided uh, by one of Mojave's collaborators, Ali Bechtas, and uh, credited there. Thank you very much for those. Okay, so I've said virus versus viroid is important. And here are kind of the key issues. A virus has a capsid. This is a some sort of protein shell around the nucleic acid used to protect uh, the nucleic acid. And also it's very important usually in how the virus gets into a new host cell. Usually there's specific uh, protein host cell interactions. Some viruses additionally have a lipid layer around that. That's kind of irrelevant at this point. But the point is there's something to protect the nucleic acids. Protected nucleic acid genome, either DNA or RNA, means it's able to survive fairly well in an environment. So a lot of plant viruses can be, uh, you know, a plant can get sick, it can shed the virus into soil, and these shielded protected uh, genetic entities can stay there and now be ready to infect another potential host plant. Um, or it makes it easier for them to move on some other vector like an insect. Viroids are like a virus, but they're naked nucleic acid. So uh, key point number one is that means little to no long-term survival outside of a plant cell. Note that I said long-term. We said that this is you know, 240 million copies per milligram of tissue. If you have infected tissue and you smear it on a surface and you go test, you're going to find some of this because even if you do a million fold reduction in it, well, that's still a you know, 240, if it was 240 million, um, it's still a lot. Um, how does it generally move around? Well, since it doesn't have this capsid, it doesn't go easily into the soil and transfer into something else. It usually needs something like an insect vector. So an insect comes and bites an infected plant, uh, gets this all over its proboscis, goes to a healthy plant, shoves that through the cell wall, and now you've moved it, kind of like a mosquito uh, as a vector for human diseases, same idea. Um, the other way that's important in cultivation is when you're using tools, creating mechanical injury, things like pruning shears, if you're doing some sort of trimming, if you go trim an infected plant, you just smear this stuff all over that pruning surface and you go to a clean plant, snip, now you just made a cut and injected this into the plant. Most viroids also move by what's called vertical transmission. Um, and for a lot of viroids, it's actually their major route. Vertical transmission means essentially uh, parent to seed to progeny. This has been uh, studied in hops since one of the uh, references I've left in this talk at the end. Uh, if people wanna look it up, they'll be able to see the details there. Um, HLVD does not appear to move primarily via vertical transmission, although the, the actual wording, they say seed non-transmissible. If you read the paper closely, the numbers go down, they don't go to zero and it doesn't take, uh, it, doesn't, it takes any non-zero number to spread it. So it is seed transmissible, but it's certainly not its most efficient route. And I suspect that this means that insects, although it's not well documented, I haven't seen a, a, a proven case of insect vectoring yet. My suspicion is that insect vectors are probably important here. Um, if seeds aren't the main route, something has to be spreading this in the wild and probably insects. Okay, so what are the implications for in-facility control? Well, right there, I'm gonna say control of insect pests. And of course, this isn't just for hoplite and viroid, this is for all kinds of things. So you get uh, you know, good benefit. If you can control insects in your facility, you're gonna help yourself in a lot of different ways. Sterilizing of tools is also really important. So the example I gave of pruning shears and not just sterilizing them, but the method. So common methods that people use in the lab for sterilizing tools include things like ethanol. Ethanol is uh, good for bacteria. If you had a uh, lipid encapsidated virus, it would be effective. But I'll tell you for, for a naked nucleic acid, not effective. In fact, if you have a tool, a metal tool and you got hoplite and viroid on there and you dip it in ethanol, you're actually just gonna precipitate and stick that RNA to the surface. You may actually make the problem worse. So ethanol, not good. 
10% domestic bleach, cheap, readily available, very effective. The nice thing with a liquid uh, means of sterilizing things is it gets into all the little cracks and crevices and crannies and around inside the thing. But bear in mind, if you're going to use bleach, um, you need to make this fresh at least daily. If you made that bleach a couple of days ago, um, you're, you're not doing anything except making yourself think you're helping if you use it. And I can speak from a clinical environment, techs are busy. This is one of the things that if nobody's looking over their shoulder uh, and they're having a busy day, oh, I've already got a squeeze bottle of bleach here. I made it yesterday. I'm sure that's good enough. No, it's not. Make it fresh at least daily. And don't just dip the thing in there and pull it out 10 seconds later. That'll help, but it's not good enough. It needs a reasonable dwell time, a minute, two minutes, three minutes, okay? Um, flame sterilization is actually, if I were gonna sterilize a tool, uh, one of my first choices because it's really fast. You don't need this two minutes, three minutes. Um, you just put the tool in there, give it a few seconds, get it good and hot in the oxidizing part of the flame, and then let it cool before you go trim the plant. You're not trying to cauterize the plant. Let it cool a bit. This is fast and effective, and it's effective on everything. If you really want to take this to extremes, uh, the, the sort of the nice way to do this is something called a bead sterilizer, which is a uh, kind of a tank filled with stuff that looks like very fine sand. It's quite hot. You shove your tools in there and it heats them um, without the, unlike a, a liquid bath, you can't spill it. You can't contaminate it. They're very nice, but they're expensive and not everybody has these. I know we have them here in our TC facility um, and they're very nice, but flaming is probably cheaper. Uh, I'm just going to add on here. I was asked the other day about ultraviolet light. Ultraviolet light is effective, but only where it gets on the surface um, and for long enough at enough dose. My problem with ultraviolet light and having used this in a clinical virology lab setting is shadowing. If you take a tool or a surface, there's almost always some areas that are shadowed. The light didn't get on there. And guess what? It didn't help anything. So UV is not really what I would suggest here. I think it gives you a false sense of security. So domestic bleach, 10% fresh or flame would really be what I would suggest. 10% domestic bleach is great on surfaces because it gets everywhere and for tools, flame. Um, really good choices. Okay, so how do we test for it? Well, because this is just a, a naked piece of RNA, we're really stuck with one option, which is molecular testing. We need to actually look for that RNA. Um, so one thing that I think a lot of labs are doing, they're going back to an original publication out of Matushik's lab, which is a reverse transcriptase PCR um, from 2000, right after this was discovered. Uh, I would caution people, when I looked at that primer set and I looked at current sequences in GenBank, it looks to me that one of those primers is not detecting all of the currently known sequences of this. So if you're some of the people on the call are gonna know this, so I don't wanna bore you, but for those who don't, what this basically means is you would be blind to these ones that have a mismatch to that one primer. So rather than use that primer set, um, I went to my background, which has been doing a lot of this for 30 years of assay development. And I looked at the conserved central region, which is quite small. I looked at all of sequences in GenBank and we came up with a, something that is targeted just to that. So we think this should detect um, currently known sequences that are available. We use a synthetic positive control and that enables us to confirm that the assay is working and what our sensitivity level is. Uh, it's also important in the way we do this at least, we run a paired host RNA control assay. What do I mean by that? When we get a sample, we check to see if we detect oplatin viroid, yes, no. And imagine you get an answer of no and you think, oh great, I don't have it. Well, you could get an answer of no because your RNA sample was bad. Um, so the way we control for that is we have a host expressed, um, what's called a housekeeping gene. We have an RNA marker there. And so after testing for hoplate and viroid, we then go and test, can we see this host RNA? And if we can see that, that means we have good RNA in the sample um, and our result was valid. Once in a rare while, about 2%, uh, 3% of samples, we actually find that, yeah, the RNA is degraded by the time we're getting to it. And so instead of a negative result, that's now an invalid result. You don't know what it means. You need to go back and retest. Using our control also enables us to uh, do some analytical uh, testing on this assay. Our 95% uh, lower limit of detection is 1500 copies per reaction. Given the sort of numbers I said, the 240 million per milligram, and we run about 50 milligram samples, this is uh, great real world detection. And it's nice for us to know that 
you know, where we see this. This doesn't mean we can't see less than 1500 copies. If we go down to 200 copies, we have about a 60% chance of detection. Um, but realistically, an actual infected plant is gonna have huge amounts and we don't generally see a problem. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about um, repetitive testing to help add to our certainty. So let me just quickly show you what some results look here. So down here, we have a, a negative sample and a negative control. The negative control is important because you wanna know that you're not somehow contaminating your lab and getting false positive results. Uh, we have a positive control here. We tend to run our positive controls fairly weak and that helps avoid contamination. A positive sample, it's nice for us to see that it's appreciably stronger than, than this. We have an additional means here to tell if it's a uh, contamination false positive or synthetic control because it's synthetic has some very, very slight differences from the wild type vi viroid and that enables us to differentiate them. And we have a second test we do here where we look at specificity. And again, these lower lines here are negative control and a negative sample with some noise in it. And then we have a control and a real positive. So they're very easy for us to pull apart. What are the implications of a positive test? Well, a positive test, first off, you want yourself, were there appropriate controls? So an NTC would, is your no template control. This should not show a signal. This shows a signal. You may very well have contamination in your lab. It happens, it happens in good labs. It happens in national testing labs um, more frequently than they want to admit. So not, not very often, but often if you need to think about it. So is your NTCs clean? Is your positive control good? If all your controls are good, this suggests that you have hoplite and viri in your sample. So now we ask the question, well, what's the biological impact? And this is, I think, where we're gonna talk more later on. And again, this may depend on the cultivar, may depend on the age of the plant, uh, other stressors, um, co-infection with other things, temperature stress, uh, any other kind of environmental stress, okay. What does this mean of your risk of transmission to adjacent cultivars? Well, now you obviously, if you think it's there, you have to start worrying about uh, transmission. So sanitation of tools, infect vectors, you should have been doing this already all the time, but now absolutely make sure you're doing this. If you have a way to quarantine this stuff off, that's even better, but most grow rooms don't have that luxury. Um, but bear in mind, lacking appropriate laboratory measures for in particular laboratories that are set up for diagnostic PCR, there is a significant risk of false positives, primarily from what we call amplicon contamination. Um, those of you on the, on the call familiar with uh, PCR and RT-PCR are probably all nodding your heads. What this means is the test works by amplifying a, a piece of nucleic acid um, uh, hundreds of millions of times, actually about 10 to the 10 to the 12th, 10 to the, 10 to the 13th times at least. And by doing this, um, if you get a positive test and you are sloppy at all in your lab, you can get one molecule in the wrong place and cause a false positive. So, and this happens, so you need to control for it. And again, that's why the NTCs are important. One of the things I think is really important here is consider retesting for confirmation. And when I suggest retesting, I don't mean take the same sample and test again. If that sample was contaminated somehow, it's again going to look positive. What you really want to do is an entire new sample taken at a different time, a couple of days, week later, and see what you do. And I know internally, I really like to see three samples taken on different days from the same material to really sort of know that either a positive or a negative, something that I really feel uh, confident in saying to the, to the best limits of our test, this is positive or negative. Let's flip that over and talk about implications of a negative test. So the good news for cleaning your facility is that RNA is very unstable. That works in your benefit there. It does not work in your benefit when it comes to testing. So what are the risk factors for a false negative test? Well, any sort of poor sample handling, delay in sample handling, uh, temperature extremes, ribonuclease enzymes are ubiquitous. And I see that's sharp-eyed people will see that N should be capitalized there. Um, RNA's contamination during extraction or handling can occur and that'll destroy all your RNA. Uh, freeze thaw cycling. If you make an RNA extract and then you freeze it uh, and then you thaw it, you do that a couple of times, it degrades. Storage of your extracts, uh, anything above minus 80 Celsius, it's not very good. I know we tested here, we can make extracts of from plants that are positive, put them at minus 20 and by the next day, um, a lot of that hoplite and viroid RNA is gone. And genetic variation is a big issue. Uh, RNA-based 
uh, organisms have very high intrinsic mutation rates. This has to do with how the RNA-dependent RNA polymerases work. Um, and if you get a mutation under your PCR primers, or if it's a probe-based assay under your probe, this is going to tend to be something that you're gonna, either going to have poor detection or possibly no detection of. So what are the ways we mitigate for all of these? Well, poor sample handling and RNAs contamination use your appropriate control. So this again is our RNA housekeeping marker. We know we had good RNA in the sample. So if I get a negative for hoplite and viroid, it's not because the RNA isn't there. Um, we do immediate sample to test workflows. Those samples are taken uh, straight into a guanidine buffer. We have those samples in our hands within two hours and we get results same day on this. We don't wanna let it sit because I know our sensitivity goes down. Dedicated RNA handling equipment if you're going to run an RNA lab. So aerosol resistant uh, tips, sphere pipetters, diethyl pyrocarbonate treated water, all standard stuff in an RNA lab. Um, I talked about repeat sampling and testing. Um, I really like to see more than once. And if you can do more than once in more than one lab, that's even better. In fact, we're, uh, we tend to get results from two other external labs and I really like to see what they get. Um, there's nothing more useful than being told you're doing something wrong before you continue to do it. Uh, assay design is important, in particular with related to genetic variation. So there are tricks you can do or choices you can make in how you set up this assay, which make it more or less susceptible to uh, going blind to genetic variants. We've done what we can to make us uh, as least susceptible to that as possible. And again, I'm just going to reiterate, multiple negative results in the context of passing controls increases your confidence. So you got it. Can, can you cure it? Well, here's again where we're going to talk mostly from what's known in hops right now. And the answer is, uh, in hops, uh, tissue culture, serial passage of apical meristem tissue. So you go up and you get the prevascularized stuff right at the tip of the plant. Um, and you grow that up and you do a couple of cycles of that, usually in conjunction with either hyper or hypothermic treatment um, has been tested. And the results are somewhat mixed. There certainly seem to be cultivars or laboratories that claim to have been quite successful at this, but it looks like not all cultivars um, respond to this equally well. Um, one thing that is interesting though, is that at worst, if you go through this, it does seem to greatly knock down viroid load. So one of the papers shown in my references here suggests that they weren't always able to cure it, but what they were able to do was cause about a 20X reduction. So they, they in their case, they merely used uh, heat treatment, um, not even apical meristem, just heat treatment. And a couple of rounds of that, they were able to um, reduce viroid load. The viroid load stayed low for at least six months, which if you can do this and then get your growth cycle within six months, maybe that's really helpful because there's no symptoms. But then they say after about six months, if you didn't fully clear it, it will start to come back up. And there certainly are cases where permanent viroid clearance has been reported. And it looks like maybe the hypothermic, the low temperature treatments may be a little bit more effective there. That's uh, a bit in contrast, in my understanding, to most other uh, viroid clearance or virus clearance in plants, which usually hyperthermic is better. Um, it's kind of interesting. And this is certainly a, a focus of active research in cannabis. And our TC lab here is uh, very actively pursuing this because of course it's something that um, would be wonderful if we could come up with a reliable way to do. Um, and then it's worth asking, is there an alternative? And I'd say really, well, not one that I can think of because I'll tell you, if you use traditional cuttings, um, you get a 100% probability of transmission. So um, this is probably the way to go. We may have to uh, optimize techniques a little bit, but it looks like in most cases, it'll at least be able to be suppressed and or cured. So there is light at the end of the tunnel here. Okay, in-house, what do we do to try to mitigate all this? Well, um, during tissue culture initiation, we pass things through apical meristem, um, and we are now doing this repeat testing of cultivars post-initiation. We use the in-house assay. And as I mentioned, we're actually, we do also use in, uh, external assays as well. Um, it's nice to see some confirmation there. And we run all the appropriate controls and these uh, accuracy mitigation processes like having our host RNA con control assay. Uh, we require multiple negative tests consecutively off different samples before we consider it hoplate and viroid clean. If we get a positive result, we will send stuff back. We'll try the reinitiation again and see if we can clear it. We normally want to be looking at doing cultural reinitiation every two to three years anyway. Um, 
unrelated, but of course, soma clonal variation, you can get uh, genetic variants in plants and tissue culture year after year after year. So generally what you do is you check that something is genetically what you want. We use our VNTR test to do that and we reinitiate anyways, and that's good practice for this as well. And as I said, we've got ongoing R&D into optimizing initiation conditions for hoplite and virate clearance. Okay, so some other considerations. Um, there are thousands of known plant viruses. Many of these are very broad host range. Um, my feeling is, is that as cannabis moves out of uh, a couple of Rastafarian guys in a basement to large scale culture, monoculture, you're running a risk. You, anytime you take a host organism and you put large numbers of it crowded together, it makes a good place for pathogens to adapt to. And I suspect that some of these other viruses will adapt to or be newly recognized in cannabis. So this is gonna be a continuous ongoing, growing list of things that might show up. And testing, you only get able to test for so many things. So it's only ever gonna cover a subset of prime suspects. Hoplite and viroid is uh, the flavor du jour and so number one for now, but at some point something else may be more important. I think it's critical to understand that these best practices, uh, tissue culture, meristematic induction, and sanitation sort of things, not only reduce risk for things that we know, but the things that we don't know about. Um, so it's preventative in that sense, not just, not just for this, but do it because if a year from now it turns out something is a problem, until the rules change and we can uh, start using different kinds of um, pest management chemicals, which certainly at least in the Canadian system is not allowed, uh, these control practices are the best and often the only tool we have, but they work on everything. It's also really important to observe plant health and immediately quarantine and investigate if you see overtly diseased plants. Look, if you see a diseased plant, that's meaningful. If you see a healthy plant, that's meaningful too, right? At the end of the day, what you want are healthy plants. Okay, so quick recap here. I'm probably using up my time. So hoplite and viroid is definitely out there in some cultivars, but not all. We know we have uh, more than 20, so it's about 25 now here that uh, we have just in-house that have been through multiple tests and are clean for this and a handful of other things we check for. I would say that it's not readily spread from infected cultivars to uninfected cultivars as long as good basic handling practices and pest control are in place. Um, I didn't say it earlier, but things like uh, having appropriate HEPA filtration on your airflow is good as well. So you don't have particulate matter, uh, which might be contaminated flying around your place. Uh, hoplite and viroid may be curable. Um, looks like it is in some cases, and even where it's not, it's at least suppressible enough to not have significant impacts. Um, and those measures which do this are also protective against other things. Molecular testing can identify hoplite and viroid, but, and I want to stress, um, genetic variation, sample issues, or completely other uh, viruses or viroids could lead you getting a passive negative test when there's actually some sort of virus or viroid present. I spent most of my career in a clinical virology lab building and, and releasing assays for new human viruses. And we always had a line on our reports that said, interpret your test results in clinical context. And this means very much here the same thing. If you have a sick plant, it's obviously sick and you get a negative hoplite and viroid test, the plant's still sick. It may not be hoplite and viroid, may, or maybe it is with its genetic variation. Uh, maybe you do multiple HLVD tests and they all come back negative. You still have a sick plant. Look, that's what's important. Uh, conversely, if you have plants that look healthy, um, I'd be worried if they're hoplite and viroid positive, if they look healthy, I'd be worried about them as a potential source for spreading it. I would work on control, but I wouldn't rush to get rid of what looks like a healthy plant. Again, it may turn out there are cultivars which can harbor this and it uh, doesn't have an effect, just like a lot of different hops varieties. Okay, um, I said we'd talk a little bit more about um, some, some visualization here. And again, these are uh, courtesy of Ali Bechtes. So here we have uh, on the left side, and I hope people can see my feeble little uh, fake laser pointer. These two are the same cultivar. And the one on the left here is uh, a, a healthy, clean plant. And you can see how the bud looks quite different here on the right. It's kind of you know, got all these, you know, these fibrils sticking out and kind of just, it doesn't look very good. So this is a suspected hoplite and viroid plant. Uh, we showed this before. This is the uh, it's kind of the stunting, the dwarfism. 
other symptoms. Uh, this one has uh, sort of leaf modeling. You'll see how it's kind of not uniform everywhere. And on this one, you can see the if you look, see the chlorosis, that's not just the lighting, you'll see how it's paler and yellower up the center and darker along the edges, which is not a good sign for a plant in, in any case. There's a lot of things that can cause chlorosis, but hoplite and viroid is certainly one of them. Okay, so um, we're gonna have time for questions, but I think now at this point, what I'd like to do is pass this over to Mojave, who will tell you more from the cultivator side, some of his thoughts, and then I think we'll move out of that uh, into, into the questions. Thank you, Dr. Brunstein. That was a great presentation. A lot of really valuable information um, on hop latent. Yeah, um, I, I first started seeing symptoms in plants um, around 2003, 2004. Um, one of the early um, cultivars that was is uh, suspected of spreading hop latent around was sour diesel, and um, Started just seeing, you know, at similar symptoms that Dr. Brunstein described: um, poor vigor, low yield, deformed leaves, um, reduction in cannabinoids and terpenes. Um, one anecdotal uh, little comment: um, I'm not not saying this is where it started, but I, one a coincidence is that um, one of the um, cultivators that was growing hop latent, I mean, that was growing sour diesel, and we were exchanging clones, was also doing some experimenting with with home brewing. And they were even doing some hops cannabis brews. Um, so that's just a little little anecdote because we'd all like to know where it first started, um, where this this crossover from hops to cannabis happened. But um, anyway, we started seeing these strange plants, and over the years, we've seen I've seen lots of strange plants. We you know sometimes there's just poor health or or improper growing conditions that just makes the plant kind of go south. But um, around that time, we really started to see something that looked like a virus. And the, you know, people suspected it was TMV or Fusarium or something like that. Um, or there was uh, one theory was that it was the photocopy effect that you know, after you clone a clone and a clone a clone, you kind of just get a reduced, um, you know, a, a pale version of the original. And um, so because of that, you know, sour diesel was not in production nearly as much as it was previously. And people kind of just suspected that the plant had just kind of lost its, its, um, its vigor. But um, over the years, um, started to see a lot of plants showing similar symptoms. And by around 2014, 2015, um, it seemed to be uh, a number of people were, were seeing the same thing. I think that was when the the term duds started to go around through the through the cannabis forums, um, and at, at this point, you know, people knew that there was something there. They they were you know a, lots of hypotheses of, of what was causing it. At this point, now you know there were some images of stem nematodes creeping up through the um, the the underneath the cambium layer and all kinds of you know suspected culprits, but no one really knew what it was. Um, and at, at, I think it was 2018, um, Robert Clark um, and, and I, my business partner, we were touring some greenhouses in, um, in Salinas and the, the head cultivator had pointed out some plants that he called dutters. He said, look, here's some dutters. And we'd never heard that term at that point, or at least never, never had it, never, Never, we didn't, we'd heard of dudding, but at this point they were, they were calling it dudder's disease. Like this is, these are dudders. And it was, it was all throughout the greenhouse. Um, they knew what was going on. They didn't know what was causing it, but you know, there's still, people still thought it was possibly nutrient deficiencies, you know, just add some more CalMag and, and you'll fix that. Um, but it was obvious that there was something going on. And um, Rob and I, we wrote a piece for uh, Cannabis Business Times um, commenting on this Dutter's disease. And it caused a considerable amount of alarm from, from readers in the community that there was this unknown, unknown um, disease that was rampant in the cannabis industry, but nobody knew what it was. And um, so that, that's kind of scary, you know, this kind of phantom disease that's creeping around. And um, there was groups like uh, Humboldt DNA had coined the term PCIA for putative cannabis infectious agent. And there was a number of groups that knew there was something happening, you know, and, and 
And it wasn't until 2019 that Darkheart um, uh, discovered that it was hop latent virus. And that was, uh, that was uh, Darkheart was, um, Ali Bektas was working with Darkheart Dark as well as uh, Joseph Ramahi and Jeremy Warren. And they discovered hop latent. Um, and at that point, you know, the California nursery system had spread plants all around. You know, it had, it had pretty much penetrated every corner of California. And at this point, you know, um, all throughout the States, Canada, and even around the world, you know, as we know, California is often as, as goes, as, as does California, so goes the nation was, you know, but so it, it, it was, we were spreading hop latent infected plants all over the world at this point. Um, so now we knew what we had. We knew we had hop latent virus. We didn't know what was causing um, the, we knew that there was a, a virus there, but we didn't know what was really causing the, the, um, the symptoms. Just like um, Dr. Brunstead had mentioned in hops, hop latent viroid is not, doesn't have nearly as much of an impact on the overall health of the plant. That's kind of why they call it hop latent. It just kind of shows up. Later on, very few cultivars are as impacted as cannabis. Although I think that that's kind of disputable. Um, it's kind of, you know, uh, hops are perennials and um, they're maybe not scrutinized as much as the modern cannabis industry in terms of their, their, um, their uh, overall terpene content, for instance. Um, so anyway, so at this point we knew we had hop latent virus. In 2020, um, Rob and I and Ali Bektas, we wrote a piece, another piece for, hop, uh, for uh, Cannabis Business Times comparing hop latent viroid and, and um, COVID-19. And um, we coined the term CDS, cannabis disease syndrome, just to kind of highlight the fact that we couldn't attribute all the symptoms to hop latent at this point. And you, you know, we, we knew that hop latent was there, but we didn't know exactly what was causing these plants to look so, you know, to grow so poorly. Similar to, to um, COVID-19, there seems to be, you know, the, what, 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 kills the, what kills people is the, the um, co-infections that come along with it, you know, things like respiratory problems and stuff. So now we know there's hop latent and we know that there's possibly some type of a, of a you know, just a immunocompromised plant that is now susceptible to a world of problems. You know, one thing I've noticed over the years is that hop latent infected plants tend to, um, to be susceptible to fungal infections. You know, if you um, if you tear up, you know, you've got a slow rooting plant that with a wound, and slow slow rooting plants tend to be more likely to have problems with fungus in the root zone. And because of that, you know, I've noticed that there's often this this fungal infection working its way up through through the um, vascular system, and whether that's spreading the hop latent or whether that's just you know a weakened uh, the the sign of a weakened plant that is more susceptible to other, other path pests and pathogens is not really sure. We're not really sure about that. But one thing I've definitely noticed is that these hop latent infected plants tend to have, um, you know, if you have something like um, fungus gnats, for instance, the fungus gnat larva will just eat right up through the crown into into the the, the center of the plant, just chowing away at all that fungus. So there seems to be this co-infection thing, you know, we don't really know at this point, um, but it seems to be the case. And what, what I've, I've noticed over the years is, you know, these plants, you know, they have clear signs of infection, but there's a lot of um, asymptomatic plants, you know, similar to, once again, similar to COVID-19. You have these plants that are known to be infected, but still grow really well and show no, you know, um, deleterious effect. Um, so we, we don't really know, I guess is the, is the point, you know, that just like Dr. Brunstein said, regardless of whether or not you have hop latent viroid or, um, or not, the, these new 
new practices to, to ensure that you're not spreading disease and pests and pathogens throughout your facility are really, really critical. So I kind of look at this as being um, a moment for everyone to kind of pause and reflect on what their, their best practices are in their facilities to, to mitigate the risk of not just hop latent viroid, but a lot of other, a lot of other um, problems that could be present. And, you know, there's, there's always going to be something around the corner um, that that's going to be an issue. So this is just our, our first trial run at, at taking cannabis into an industrial kind of global model and um, figuring out a way to, to, to make clean um, certified plants that we can kind of move around. I've done a, a bit of consulting internationally and there has been unfortunately cases of new markets that are opening up and their, their initial stock has to come from from a fully regulated market and some of those um, initial um, onboarding of genetics came in infected and you know or, or possibly there was you know someone you know we don't know there's someone who could have could have um, could have brought them from their home garden or something like that but what we did what we have seen is that entire entire um, facilities in these new emerging markets are all infected with hop latent viroid and this is from you know far corners around the world. So it's it's something that we really have to take seriously. And, you know, it's it's had a big impact on the cannabis genome as a whole, arguably more than prohibition. You know, we're seeing a lot of people who are having to start from scratch and um, either, you know, plant new seed or source genetics from new clean clean sources. So it's, uh, and, and that's something that we, you know, we, we as an industry need to adopt at some point as some type of a clean certification system like other, other crops have that can guarantee that our plants are, are free from a whole list of potential um, problems. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of my history with hop latent. Um, you know, I've, uh, I've been cultivating cannabis for a long time, and you know there's lots of challenges that cultivators are um, that, that we face. But I've never seen something quite as vicious as hop latent viroid. So um, I think it's really a good time for us all to to focus and and um, pay attention to to uh, what we're learning today. Um, so anyway, I I do have a couple questions that I'd like to pass over back to Dr. Um, Brumstein about um, specifically about um, asymptomatic plants. Dr. Brunstein, have you, um, I'm wondering if you've ever found asymptomatic plants that, um, that are, are um, or excuse me, let me rephrase this. Have we ever identified hop latent positive plants that are showing symptoms, but testing negative of all other possible pathogens? And I think you're muted, Dr. Brunstein. I was indeed. Um, so I, I didn't want to be taken away from uh, your talk there, so I shut off my screen sharing. But I just wanted to bring it back up here. So while we're having this chat, I mentioned um, uh, resources. That these are some papers that I found were very useful. And I think some of the viewers here may want to go uh, see this and, and go look. So I'll leave this up here for a little bit while we, while we chat. Uh, so your question was, have we seen something that um, looks like it has all the symptoms, but tests negative. Is, is that what your sort of your crux was there? Um, no, actually it's something that tests positive, but is testing negative of all other pathogens. Like, like are we seeing, you know, um, have, are, are we testing for fusarium? We, when once we find a hop latent plant that's, that's positive and symptomatic, how can we be certain that it's not something else that's causing the symptoms and not hop latent? So we have the ability to test for um, a range of other things, including uh, fusarium, botrytis, uh, sclerotinia, um, uh, beet curly top virus, um, in addition to hop latent viroid, and we do that on a paired sample. Those are all DNA targets, so we do a second sample for those. We ha don't have enough data yet to really answer that question in a way I'd be really comfortable. I would say that right now, what we have seen, so we don't generally see those other things. We certainly don't see them on stuff going out. If it was in tissue culture, we detect it and we have, we test routinely for those things and it all looks good. Um, so I would say we have seen hoplite and viroid just by itself in the, what we have looked at so far. Um, but I 
don't want to take away from uh, your comment about co-infections because I suspect in the real world, that's probably very true. Um, and we just haven't seen enough samples yet or the right samples to look at that. Generally, co-infections are a lot worse than single infections and one tends to predispose you towards the other. Uh, remember that the viroid needs mechanical damage. I noticed you were talking about fungal infections and talking about essentially a wound. Something like that is a place where now you have a way that viroid can get into that plant and infect it. So I think it's quite serious and likely to be co-infections. Yeah, because because I'm, I'm wondering, you know, um, if we have these, these um, asymptomatic plants that, you know, there's these typhoid Mary plants that are going around that people are just confident that don't have hop latent viroid and they're not being tested. And they're, they're possibly the, the main vectors within um, a group because, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's easy, it's much easier to, to, to see the infection in a flowering plant, obviously, than a vegetative plant. And if you're, if you're, uh, you know, your one of your varieties is not test is not hasn't been tested because they assume that it doesn't have hop latent, which brings up another question. You know, um, when when I first got plants tested for hop latent virus, one of the um, the labs what they the, what they mentioned to me is that don't look for it. Uh, try to find don't don't look for infected plants. You know, or infected parts of the plant because that's another uh, aspect that I think people should understand is that it's not um, it's sometimes just present in one portion of the plant, or at least the viral load is higher in one portion of the plant, that you kind of, you have to take these, these uh, samples from various parts of the plant, and then they're homogenized. And the only real way to know that a whole plant is, is, um, is not infected is kind of to test as many possible portions of the plant as, as possible. So how many, how many samples would you recommend from uh, you know a small or a mid-sized vegetative plant, should people be um, or is a, is a fair amount of, of leaf samples to ensure that a plant is either positive or negative? So it's an interesting question, and I'm going to have to be blunt. We we don't have really good numbers on this. I suspect, given the sort of viral titers here, again, I'm going to go back to that number: 240 million per milligram. Right, that's an immense number. Uh, Plant vasculature moves things around, RT, PCR tests, or um, some people are using isothermal RNA amplification assays uh, in-house. All of those are very, very sensitive. And I suspect if you have a positive plant, a sample from almost anywhere except uh, meristematic tissue should test positive. You don't need 240 million <laughs> in your sample to detect. You need, uh, you know, 1500 is the kind of number we say we have a 95% probability. So first, first point is I would suggest that, um, yeah, diverse samples are good, um, but if your plant's positive, even the low titer areas should test positive in a molecular assay. Personally, just because of sampling variabilities and other issues, uh, the number I like to see is three samples per plant. And as I said, I don't really like those taken at the same day and the same time. If somebody has a contaminated tool, for instance, now everything they touch looks positive and you're getting bad news, it isn't real. Um, and conversely, if they're doing something which is uh, not good in the sampling process or those samples are all getting too warm on the way to you and the RNA is degrading, uh, everything in that batch is, is impacted. So what I really like to see is take a sample and you're right, it doesn't, if you have what looks like an infected area, fine, um, but just, just give me a reasonable, a reasonable sample. Um, and then a couple of days or a week later, a second sample, a couple of days or a week later, a third sample. Personally, and this is somewhat of an arbitrary number, but it is based on some statistical analysis. If I see three samples sequentially, three different samples off that same material and they're all negative, I think you've kind of exhausted the result, the, what you can do with that assay. Bear in mind, different assays, if, especially if they have different primer sets, may see slightly different things. And I know we occasionally see discordances with external tests. We've seen things that we detect as positive that were negative externally and vice versa. Um, and we're still digging into what exactly does that mean, but my suspicion is probably genetic variability in the target and different assays will give you slightly different results. I like to see three, mm -hmm. quick answer. Great, yeah, that, that, that makes sense. Um, another thing I've, I've wondered um, is, you know, I, I've heard that, uh, or we, at least I've, I've 
there's been speculation that TMV is transmittable through um, tobacco, dried tobacco. That you know, we used to say never let someone who rolls their own cigarettes enter your grow room because TMV could be transmitted. I don't know if that's true or not, but I'm wondering about if there's any any have been any tests on dry flour. You know, you, you imagine people have uh, there's a lot of hop latent infected plants that have entered the market, and and uh, there's a considerable amount of dried flour around that um, that still may or may not um, be. So it's on. a yeah, it's a really interesting question. So the first point I'm, I'm going to make out, remember, this is a viroid. TMV is a virus, right? So TMV has a helical capsid. It's these long, helical, squiggly, worm-looking viruses. And that capsid helps protect it. Having said that, uh, this came up in a discussion uh, yesterday with, with someone. And if you have um, plant tissue which has RNA in it, like, like this viroid, if you dry, if you desiccate it, if you dry it down, um, you are going to increase the survivability of that RNA because you're getting um, water molecules away from it. And a lot of the breakdown of RNA comes from uh, basically oxygen radicals or water radicals created from various things attacking the nucleic acid. So you're getting rid of that. And you're also, the fact that it's inside the plant, now it's not getting hit by ultraviolet light. It's not exposed as much to ribonucleases. Um, enzymes in that cell that might degrade the RNA are shut off because of the lack of water. So all of those will contribute to uh, increased survivability of that RNA and potential for vectoring. The fact that it's dried down also makes it a little harder for it to get out of there. But where I was discussing this is similar to what you were saying. I was suggesting to somebody that if they had infected material, and let's say they were then processing that and then taking it to a drying room. And they're, if they're doing something to create any sort of aerosolized dust from that, I was concerned. Um, and this is again where I came back and said, look, do you have HEPA filtration in place? So at least you're not going to get naked bits of RNA floating up through the air. But you are going to get ones inside little particulate matter. And if that gets someplace and then rehydrates, that RNA won't last very long but it might last long enough to cause problems. Again, we're talking about something with astronomically high numbers of viroid in an infected plant. So it only takes a couple of those to make it through to cause a problem. So yes, I do suspect uh, dried material uh, has at least some potential to be a vector. And the way to that is try not having that spread around your grow room, right? And use HEPA filtration. If you have a, a drying and curing facility, make sure that's that's HEPA filtered, or at least the air coming into your grow room is is HEPA filtered. Really good point. Um, okay, well, we've got some great questions that have already been submitted um, that I'd like to um, ask you now. Um, what is a reliable sample size needed from a plant and from how many parts? Oh, we already answered that. Um, how many plants to ensure a negative plant? Um, sample size, I'll comment, and that depends on the individual assay. We use about 50 milligrams. I try to tell people that's about half a peppercorn. Uh, more than that just jams up our extraction process. And again, given the massive loads of virus here, viroid, uh, that's more than enough for us to get a reliable test, but I want to see it three times. Okay. And are there variants of hop, uh, hop latent viroid? Should yeah, whoever asked that, uh, great question. I, they already know the answer and <laughs> we kind of touched on it. Uh, yes, look, this is an RNA pathogen. The bad news is these things have um, error prone replication, it has to do with some thermodynamic things around how, the way the enzyme works and it doesn't have what's called a proofreading function. Uh, from the viroid perspective, this is a good thing, it enables it to adapt rapidly to new hosts. From a trying to detect it perspective, it's not so good because it means you can get genetic diversity. This is why I was saying that when we developed our test, we chose uh, a method for setting it up which relies on the least number of bits of viral sequence. We also chose them in the conserved area. Now, conserved region means that there's some sort of biological pressure to keep that sequence as is. In other words, if you change that too much, it doesn't work very well. One of the references that I just uh, was on that thing that I just took down there is when they heat treated uh, hot plants with HLVD, um, they, like I say, they, they knocked the numbers down, they knocked the symptoms down for at least six months, but they also looked at mutation rates and their results there from a relatively crude approach where they better than 54% of the HLVD sequences had diverged 
from the parental type. So yeah, we have to assume there's variance and this is part of my concern of no matter what test we make, could we get something, is it possible you could get something that doesn't show up on a test? The lab's doing everything great, whoever that lab is, maybe they're, they're a perfect lab. Uh, you could still potentially get something that looks negative. And this goes back to if the plant looks really sick uh, and you have a negative hoplite and viroid result, maybe it's not hoplite and viroid, maybe it's mutated hoplite and viroid, maybe it's another problem. You still have a sick plant and don't just pretend there's no problem. Great. Um, I see we got a lot of questions coming in. Um, so I got one more question that was pre-submitted. Um, what protocols or processes do you have in place during production and transport to protect plants? So during production, uh, tissue culture is actually fairly good for this because everything's done in little closed bottles. Um, and we we don't see evidence, uh, you know, we have um, a couple of cultivars which have this, those are important for us to do research on things like clearance and for positive controls for my assays. And we don't see it jumping into the other things because they're in little sealed bottles and thyroids don't magically teleport through glass. So uh, that along with uh, sanitation, we do things inside uh, BSC laminar flow cabinets that are sterilized. We use these bead sterilizers, which I say are, they're, they're even nicer than a flame sterilizer, but they're expensive, um, but we have them, they're, they're nice if you have a fixed facility. So uh, good sanitation, uh, good isolation of materials, uh, when stuff's shipped, again, it's shipped inside a sealed container. It's not risk. When you bring it out in the other facility, if you have insects walking around that facility, um, that's not a good sign. Now you, you got clean stuff in the door. It may not stay clean very long. Mm. Yeah, good point. It's only, yeah. Um, all right, well, let's get on to some of these questions being submitted um, live right now. we got a question from Liam. Um, have you come across a figure describing how long hop latent can persist outside of a plant cell? Uh, no, but here's the comment. Uh, naked RNA is, like I say, quite unstable. It's an, it's an exponential type decay curve, meaning most of your decay happens right away, and then it's slower and slower and slower and slower. Remember that the detection methods here are molecular. They're RT-PCR or uh, isothermal RNA amplification assays. These can detect one or two copies. If you have a five kilogram cannabis plant, it's probably a fairly large one, but imagine you had a five kilogram plant that was infected at 240 copies per milligram. You can work the math. It's like 10 to the 12th copies of viroid. Okay, so you now you take this plant, you grind this whole plant up and you smear it across some surfaces and you say, well, RNA is unstable. Let's do a million fold reduction in the amount of RNA there. That sounds great, right? Well, the problem is if you started with 10 to the 12th copies, you do a million fold reduction, you still have a million copies there. So uh, it decays pretty quickly. If you are going into an area and you're doing things like wipe tests and these keep coming up positive, a couple of thoughts. One is my immediate guess is that you are continuously reseeding that area. You're getting it there again and again. The other thing is, and this applies to RT-PCR assays, which are let's call them semi-quantitative. If you don't run a standard curve, they're not exact, but they are generally quantitative. It does not apply to isothermal assays, which are purely qualitative. If you're running an, a quantitative or semi-quantitative RT-PCR and you're doing environmental sampling, look to see if the numbers are going down, right? Mm -hmm. If they're not going down, you're doing something wrong. If you're going down, stay the course, you're on the right track, you're going to get rid of it. Um, in terms of how long, it really depends on the temperature, the light exposure, the UV exposure. Uh, there's too many variables there to give a, a strict number on that. It's gonna yeah, differ that, every place. That's, I, I find that to be a really critical question that hopefully we'll get to some understanding because I know there's a lot of people out there that are going through a lot of uh, trouble sterilizing their benches. Put, put bleach in that service and its survival is zero. Right. If you let it dwell there for a few minutes, put it that way. Right, exactly. Um, okay, great. Now we got a question from Erica. Um, nettles were mentioned as an alternate host. Does this have implications for wild weed nettles being an alternate alternate host and reservoir in the wild? It's an interesting question. Uh, probably, I don't know how diverse, uh, how widely spread this is in wild nettles. Um, I have one reference that said it, uh, that it's been detected in nettles. Um, I would ask you how often do you take a nettles plants and running around inside your grow facility with them? Um, or letting insects from outside get into your grow facility. If you're doing either of those, I'd worry about it. It's, it's certainly a potential reservoir. Um, 
but nettles for the most part aren't grown in anything like the density of cannabis plants. Um, it's probably not a big risk for most of us, but yeah, I don't have a, a decorative nettles garden outside your cannabis thing and a, and an insect door for things to go back and forth. Bad idea. No fresh nettle tea when you're out you, there. <laughs> well, boil the nettle tea, yeah. but boiling it won't actually destroy RNA. It, you know, it's going to survive that. So yeah, probably no nettle tea. Okay. Um, and a question from an anonymous attendee. Uh, can hoplite and viroid be transmitted through roots via irrigation water? Can leaf rubbing between an infected plant and a healthy plant cause contamination through micro tears? Uh, I'll answer the second one first. Yes, if there's, so again, this is, if there is direct contact between those and there are breaks in the cell wall, assume contact and transmission will occur. Uh, the water and root, I think this is a statistical issue. Look, if you imagine you have two cannabis plant cuttings, you have a healthy plant and you have an infected plant, you make cuttings of both so they have an open wound, there's sap there, and you stick those both in a beaker of water, I would fully expect that you're going to get some of those millions and millions and millions of things. A few of them are going to make it over there. If you have an irrigation table, uh, I would not knowingly share infected, infected plants with uninfected plants on the same irrigation table. I don't think that's a good idea. And just as an aside, probably the worst thing I ever saw uh, was at a grow facility in California where they had irrigation tables at a slight slope and they continuously recirculated the water on that table. They thought they were being, you know, very economical with their water, but they had, they had known fusarium in the roots on some of the plants on the table. And it's like, what, you know, what are you doing? You're just, you're, you're recirculating this around and around. If you do something like that, there is some risk. Generally, that RNA is not going to survive very long in the water, but if you have enough of it get in there, you could have some spread. I don't think it's real high risk, but I would avoid doing it. It's not smart. Yeah. I know there's some studies on tomatoes where um, they've been able to transmit a tomato virus from plant to plant just with a stem. Virus, not viroid. Again, viruses have a shell. They're designed to transmit through the environment. Viroids are not. Naked RNA, I, you know, I told you, we purify this stuff. If I put it at minus 20 Celsius, it's gone the next day in the freezer. That's how mm -hmm. unstable this kind of RNA is. Wow. Wow. Um, okay, here's a question from Erica. For flame sterilization, is an open flame necessary or do we know key temperatures to reach? Uh, I don't have those temperatures off the top of my head. I would use an open flame and get it in the oxidizing portion. You want it hot enough to actually be degrading nucleic acids, actually literally burning them. Um, you don't have to make the thing glow orange hot like you do with a microbiology loop, but get it in the oxidizing part of the flame for two or three seconds and get it you know, all over the blade and then let it cool in the air. For, for several seconds, so you're not cauterizing the plant. Um, that will do the job. Exact temperatures, uh, I don't know, 400 up, probably something like that. Ba baking at around 400, as I recall, is pretty effective on RNA, but I don't quote me, I'd have to go check that number. Okay, and another question from Erica. Um, if, you had a, if you had to guess, what type of insect would most likely be the vector for a specific- for this Hungry ones. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not trying to be flippant there. Uh, uh, any insect that is puncturing through the cell wall and then going to another plant, I think you have to assume whether it's been shown or not, assume that can vector it. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe some are more efficient than others, mm -hmm. depending on how much they smear around on their proboscis, but any of them are going to do it. There is no good insect biting an infected plant and going to an uninfected plant that's good news for you. They're all bad. They're all potential vectors. It's just a question of, uh, risk levels, but they're all a risk. Yeah. And I, I would add that, you know, the, the most common insects uh, seem to be the ones that love to bear, bury themselves and burrow right underneath the crown and work their way into the stem being thrips and fungus gnat larva. Oh. Thrips um, are known for uh, a couple of other cannabis viruses, not viroids, um, as being a specific very high importance vector. But yeah, uh, aphids, thrips, anything like that, assume they can move this. Uh, mm -hmm. It's very risky not to believe that's likely. Yeah. And here's a question from Nima. Um, is there any data that shows that plants in indoor settings or outdoor greenhouse setups are more or less susceptible to hop latent viroid? Not that I'm aware of. Um, it's an interesting question. It might more likely be an indirect. If you see an effect, I suspect it's more indirect and relates to stressors and mm -hmm. overall health. I suspect those plants in those two environments have, uh, they have different environmental stressors and impacts. And uh, 
Yeah, I don't know. Interesting question. Yeah, my experience there has been that outdoor plants seem to be less symptomatic. Um, my suspicion is it has something to do with fluctuations in temperature. Um, they're in an indoor environment. We tend to kind of put plants at this quote unquote ideal temperature and conditions. And that might just also be ideal for, um, for, for hoplite and viroid to, um, you know, spread. So I'm just going to interject something there, Mojave, because I think that, that's ringing a bell with me. Look, remember how I said RNA pathogens like hoplite and viroid continuously try to mutate. They do. They, they create what's called a quasi-species swarm when they inspect something. There's a whole different genetic space they'll sample. And the if you want to attribute a, a, a reason to a to a raw piece of RNA doing something, the biological function there is to continuously try to sample what's the best adapted to the environment. We know that both hyper and hypothermic treatment um, tend to reduce HLVD load. And I think you're exactly right. Uh, you take these things and you put them all at 21 Celsius and ideal humidity, you are very quickly going to get hoplite and viroid that will adapt on to liking those conditions. And you'll the, just the one that's going to replicate the fastest is the one that does that and it's going to take over. So and then you keep it at that temperature it's going to do very well. Because it's really well adapted there, that one may also, however, be the most uh, impacted by raising and lowering of the temperature. And again, this goes back to, I'd really be interested to see, you know, if you take plants and you do this hyperthermic treatment, uh, you know, five days at 32 Celsius, it's not great for the plants, but if you do a couple of cycles of that and then recover them, um, can you effectively block problems with this? Because it would be at least a stopgap measure that we could look at doing. Mm -hmm. um, while long-term you're trying to clear it through, through other processes. Mm -hmm. um, here's a question from Troy. Um, what data is available to show efficacy of bleach against hoplite and viroid? So none specifically that I'm aware of with hoplite and viroid, but bleach hypochlorite anion is absolutely destructive of nucleic acids, DNA, and RNA. There's about 70 years of extensive data on that. Pick your any one of 5,000 papers. Okay. But again, dwell time. Don't don't take your tool and kind of wave it over the bleach, you know, the 10% bleach, or dip it in and out in in you know two tenths of a second. Oh, it's sterile. No, it needs to dwell. It needs to be fresh. 10% bleach, domestic bleach, and it needs to dwell there. Give it a minute, two, three minutes. Um, and of course, some people don't like doing that. Bleach is corrosive, right? If you're doing this on, on your fancy tools, eventually they're going to start looking kind of crappy from this. But would you rather have crappy looking tools that you can replace or an infected plant? So it's highly effective. Um, there's nothing special about HLVD. It's a piece of RNA. It doesn't like bleach. Yeah, yeah, that's why I hear uh, a number of groups using um, torches actually in, in their... Yeah, and this is why I'm saying flame, I think, is... Flame works on everything really well. It's simple. It's cheap. This is the reason microbiologists use it. Um, you know, for for inoculating loops and things like that. It's a good choice here too for tools. Bleach is really good for surfaces because it gets into nooks and crannies. Mm -hmm. And I know that there's some concern about the cool down period between cuts. But what would be the? I mean, is there? I guess in, in certain circumstances, if you're making cuttings, for instance, you're going to want to have a, a cool plant. But there might not be that much harm in cauterizing a leaf if you're just doing a a simple, you know, uh, defoliation or something. If like you're that. just defoliating to trim, it's probably not a big deal. Otherwise, you know, let it cool, you know, hold it in the air, let it cool. It's not like you're taking and smearing it all over a plant surface while it's cooling to try to recontaminate it, right? I mean, put it through the flame, let it cool over here and snip. Right. Okay. okay. Um, here's another question from Nima. Also from watching the presentation and hearing the COVID-19 analogy, it seems like the magnitude of the negative effect of HPO of hoplite and viroid can have on a plant varies from one cultivar to another. Is this true? Meaning some cultivars power through it comparatively to others. I suspect so. I think we have some at this point, I'd say it's uh, very preliminary data which suggests that. Again, remember at the outset I said most of what we know uh, in detail academically is in hops. We know that's absolutely true in hops. I would be very surprised if it's not true in uh, cannabis. Um, is this a solution? Well, it's certainly part of one. If you have a cultivar that doesn't show an impact, and again, maybe this depends also on whether it gets infected with something else, but if you have a, a cultivar that's generally resistant and it meets your other criteria for cannabinoids and the way it grows, fantastic. I, you know. If I were a cultivator, I would say that's one of the ones I want to try growing first. But 
uh, if it's still acting as a host, it's still potentially a, a, an issue for your facility because it's still in there and harboring this and it'd be better if you just didn't have it at all. Um, so it's a partial solution, but it doesn't mean you can really let up on these uh, contamination control practices. Okay, um, and here's a question from Paramjeet. Um, what is known about its possible variants? RNA is prone to mutations and therefore it should certainly have variants. I think we've already kind of beat that into the ground, yes. Yes. And the, yes, and that I, relates to the test form. Yeah, and, and at this point you mentioned there are two known variants. I, I saw when I looked in GenBank and there may be partial sequences or, or a session note or something else, but I saw um, at least two distinct versions. The central region was conserved between all those. So when we made our assay, we looked at that central region. Um, and again, there's different ways you can make these kinds of assays. Some of them require a perfect match over a bigger chunk of the genome and some require a smaller match and they have individual pros and cons. We've gone with the approach here of the one that needs the smallest amount of matching because I would like to know that if we have mutations in the non-matched area, it's not gonna affect our assay as opposed to uh, if you do something that requires a complete match, then any mutation is gonna reduce your sensitivity or make you go blind. So um, yes, it's potentially a problem. Do the best we can around that. Okay, and here's a question from an anonymous attendee. Um, tools and other disinfectant measures were mentioned. Should we be concerned about cleaning any HVAC, various fans and other equipment in the grow rooms? Flame sterilization and bleaching solutions might be difficult with certain regulations in place and the equipment itself. I've also heard of, Vir of Viricon being successful. I sincerely appreciate the inf information shared today. Thank you. You're welcome. Anonymous. <laughs> yeah. Um... I'm I'm a little surprised to hear that bleach is a problem anywhere. Um, any place you can use Viricon, I would be pretty sure that you're okay to use bleach and bleach is gonna be more effective here. Um, flame, obviously you're not gonna take a flamethrower and go up inside your HVAC system and crank up the flame. Uh, I would say, you know, things like your HVAC system, vacuum the ducts once in a while. I mean, I assume this is regular practice and change your filters regularly. Don't just leave that filter there and say, meh, we're going to go three life cycles on that filter before we change it. No, this is part of your front line at reducing uh, transmission. Again, the viroid won't move directly by itself, but it'll be on something or in something as a particle. If you have HEPA filters, it's going to really help keep that uh, distribution down where it could reseed into areas, um, you know, and get on surfaces and then potentially get back into plants. Yeah, and, and for that type of application, for the kind of broader um, sterilization, I know a lot of people are using products like Sanidate and Oxidate. Um, what is there any, um, any, any information on peroxide versus bleach or peroxide has any efficacy at all? It'll have, peroxide will work to some extent. It's not uh, ideal. Peroxide gas generators, uh, I don't have a reference in front of me, but again, the, the radical ion there does destroy uh, RNA and DNA, but it's a little bit harder to know effective dose. Um, osmium tetroxide gas, and so in a clinical setting, if you have something where you have to get something inside ductwork or something like that, we use something called osmium tetroxide gas. And I'm guessing that's probably an absolute no-no anywhere in cannabis facilities. It's incredibly toxic. It's really not good. So it's probably not very helpful here. Um, somebody was asking about a particular, like a, uh, a machine for stripping off um, the, the flowers. And if you had a big machine like that, maybe you could have it treated like that off site if you were worried about contamination getting dust into the air. Um, but no, uh, again, liquid bleach, change your filters, vacuum. Uh, yeah, peroxide will help, but I don't know if we know how much, how long, how often. Yeah, and, and I, I noticed there was also a question earlier in the chat. Um, you had mentioned um, ethanol not being effective for sterilization, but what about not, not for this? No, no, no alcohol. Uh, those are they're going to precipitate the RNA and 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 bind it down onto the surface. Uh, they're going to desiccate it. They're actually going to make it survive longer. It, it's kind of the worst thing you could do here. It works well for things like bacteria or if you have a virus which has a lipid capsid, you strip the lipid capsid off, that's great. But for a viroid, it's the worst thing you can do. You're actually gonna make the problem worse. Okay, um, here's a question from Ken. Um, are there cultivation techniques to cope with hoplatin viroid besides clean working and avoiding transmission? Do beneficial microbes or keeping up plants trace elements with rock dust help the plant to produce 
um, asymptomatically. Well, I can't comment on the uh, the second part of that other than maybe Mojave, maybe you can, but my I would say in general, the, the better nourished and healthier a plant is, the better it handles any kind of pathogen. Um, but in terms of cultivation practices, the only one that keeps popping in my mind, and this relates back to hops, again, is this thing I mentioned, you give it this elevated temperature cycle. And you don't have to do this on Maristem. You can take a, a juvenile plant, bring it up to about 32 Celsius for about five days, and then bring it out back to normal cultivation temperature. Do about three cycles of that. And yeah, that took you close to a month to do. But in hops, now you get six months plus of no visible symptoms and greatly reduced viroid levels. So if you can do that at a stage where six months will get you to uh, harvesting, I think this might be a stopgap measure. And certainly if I were a cultivator, I would probably be looking at at least trying this on a small batch and seeing if it helped, if it worked in my particular cultivar in my environment. Um, yeah, first thing I would try. Seen, um, you know, organically produced, biologically active um, soil definitely seems to, to keep hop latent at bay. Obviously it's not a cure in any way, but Plants grown in the full sun with lots of good circulation and lots of microbial health in the soil seem to make a plant that's more resistant or at least less symptomatic. I mean, I've, I've definitely seen some plants that were tested, um, tested positive, grown and completely free of symptoms. Um, so yeah, I think that healthy soil and, and you know, good, good uh, cultivation techniques can keep um, can produce a healthy plant, but that that in itself is kind of dangerous because then again, you've got these asymptomatic plants that are still capable of transmitting it to others. So, um, yeah, but definitely, you know, biological bio, uh, healthy healthy soil seems to make a big difference. Plants grown um, in you know rock wool and and um, just in a cocoa base seem to be more prone to to showing hop latent symptoms. Um, let's see. A lot of great questions here. I know we could we could take this into the afternoon. Um, which cultivars? This is from Paramjit again. Which cultivars are more prone to infection, indica dominant or sativa dominant? So first off, I'm going to say as a geneticist, um, indica and sativa re refer to plant shape morphology, and they do not segregate with genetics. Um, there's a whole bunch of publications which have suggested that. Um, they do relate to different growth factors being expressed in levels in the plant, and they may have some correlation here, but um, there's certainly none that I know. And I think the in trying to group things via uh, sativa indica in this context is probably going to lead you down the garden path to some bad results. So you yeah. don't know, and that's not how I would group things. Yeah, it's, it's uh, I mean, just, just the sati just the, the, the taxonomy behind those is, is a little bit challenging, but you could you could argue that there's possibly some um, some susceptibility to fungal infections that are more prevalent in in um, Afghanica versus. Um, but but again, that's not a genetic. So at least sativa indica is not genetically based. They do not cluster genetically. It's uh, it really it's a leaf morphology, which relates to different terpenes are all related to the growth factors that change those morphologies. So there are chemotypic clusterings, but not genetic clusterings with those. Mm -hmm. Okay, and here's a question from Liam. Um, have you found any literature or conducted any trials confirming hop latent viroid tra transmission via seeds in cannabis specifically? No, I'm not aware of that. And uh, one of the references that I had on my thing there was that in hops. And again, there they, they ended up using a term, they said seed non-transmissible, which sounds like, oh good, it doesn't go through seeds. Uh, read it closely. This is like saying a chemist saying something is non-soluble. That means less than 100 millimolar, which means yes, there's some there. And yeah, it is seed transmissible. It tends to knock down in hops in the seeds, but it gets through. I suspect we would find the same in cannabis. We don't know yet. Yeah, and I would add that the um, the case that I was mentioning earlier of a of a a, a new market, a country um, outside of Canada and the U.S. there initial, um, their, 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 um, their stock material that they brought in was all in seed. Um, and, you know, if you, if you're pheno hunting through a couple thousand seeds and you have one or two with that test positive and you don't know, and then you mechanically transmit throughout the whole lot, then, you know, they're not sure if, they're not sure what, what percentage came through in seed 
or whether it just worked its way through their their um, facility, but they definitely did you know, bring in. That being said, there could have been someone on on staff who was a home grower, and you know, who knows? Yeah. But yeah, you could also. This relates back to the earlier question. Um, I don't know if I would point the finger at nettles here, but remember if somebody did this and there's either hops, so hop cultivation nearby hops are almost all hop cultivars are infected with this stuff. Um, and hops and or nettles nearby and there's insects getting into your facility. They may have picked it up afterwards, but I suspect seeds carry this to some level. Yeah. Um, oh, here's a question from Jerry. Are you guys seeing any hop stunt viroid or hop latent virus, virus popping up? Well, hop latent, yes, that's the discussion today. We, we have seen it. Uh, hop stunt viroid, we haven't seen yet, uh, but it's certainly on our radar. There's other things that are not generally talked about. So I'm thinking about things like apple fruit crinkle viroid, which sounds like something I made up, but I didn't. Um, and not just apples, it affects hops. So it may be here as well. But again, remember, there are literally going to be a few thousand things on the potential list. And I don't think we're going to look at all of them. What would be very interesting to do if you had the time and the money would be to do um, whole genome and whole exome sequencing. So take take cannabis plants and look at all of the DNA and all in the RNA in there and do what's called a metagenomic study. And this is where you throw out everything that's cannabis in there, which is most of it. And you ask what wasn't cannabis there. And I know we've done that. We've taken dried flour and done that on the DNA side. And we see hundreds of uh, bacterial and fungal things. And we also see uh, some insect viruses uh, routinely on that. We haven't done this on the RNA side, but you could start doing that uh, it's a few thousand dollars a test and seeing it uh, present doesn't necessarily mean it's a pathogen, but if you see it present, you can develop a specific test for it. You can then do screening and you can start to say, do I see something correlate with this? I suspect over the next five to 10 years, uh, groups are going to start doing this. They're going to start digging into this and there will probably be a panel of the most likely, most frequently seen cannabis pathogens. But coming from a human virus background, there will always be something new taking advantage of these monoculture crops. So every few years, there will be something new that's going to adapt on. Yeah, I'm, you're, I'm hearing uh, raspberry bushy virus, uh, lettuce chlorosis virus. Lettuce chlorosis you know. is known in cannabis, yeah. yeah. So is uh, Arabis mosaic, um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, but, that's but for some of these, some of these, I should point out, I don't know if anybody's shown any pathology yet. And again, this kind of, remember I said, if you have a sick plant, you get a negative test, but you have a sick plant, worry that you have a sick plant. The converse of that is true as well. If you have a healthy plant and somebody comes to you, oh my God, you got um, papaya crinkle whirly virus. I don't think that's a real one. Uh, papaya crinkle whirly virus. Um, if you don't ever see any pathology, maybe that's something you just kind of say, look, I don't need to worry about things that aren't a problem. Like the hops people have done with hop latent viroid because in their case, it's not economically significant. If you don't yeah. have to make a problem of it, don't. Yeah, we're seeing a lot. I mean, now that with, with farm bill hemp, for instance, here in the US, we're seeing a lot of, um, a lot more research being done on, on hemp. And um, I think that it's a, it's, we're going to be seeing a lot of new um, viruses. Yeah, and you know, and some of those are only going to be one place. So hemp's a great example. There was uh, Colorado a couple of years ago. A couple of outdoor crops came down with the beet curly top virus, mm -hmm. which doesn't just infect beets. And the, the nice thing for for me at that point is beet curly top virus is a DNA virus. We have thousands of samples that we've looked at. Uh, we have archived DNA on our internal material. And so this was real quick to make a test for that. And now we could go screen a library. Um, we don't have archived RNA samples. It doesn't, we haven't been taking RNA samples for long and we don't at present have a good way to store them very long, but DNA we do. And so we went out and we looked at uh, about 500 samples um, and we've continued to look. I have never yet found a positive for this thing. So I think, you know, one field in Colorado got this. Um, it doesn't seem to spread elsewhere, but we are going to see things like that. Occasionally, you're going to get one that's really going to adapt into a new host, and now it's going to emerge as a problem. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think that's, um, so So a good takeaway from today is assume that, that there's a lot of stuff out there, and let's all change our cultural practices to, to um, 
mitigate any transmission and infection. Absolutely. And, and look at the health of the plant. Healthy plants are good. Unhealthy plants are bad. Don't blindly just take test results. They're very helpful. They're a good starting point, but you can get positive or negative results. They don't necessarily relate to exactly why your plant is one or the other. You want healthy plants in the end. Use whatever tools are at your disposal. All the things we're talking about here, I think, are best practices, not just for this pathogen, but for everything else. So start from that and then proceed from there. Well, I think that's a great place to, um, to end this discussion. Um, you know, thanks, thanks a lot, Dr. Brunstein and, and um, Sigurd well, thank you. For, for and, having uh, me involved. I'm, I'm really- And all uh, the people who ask questions too. Yeah. All righty. All right, thank I you guys very, very much. Um, Mojave, can you hear me? Just making sure. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great, yeah. All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. It's been a really interesting conversation and uh, don't he hesitate to reach out uh, with any follow-up questions you might have for us. And uh, we really look forward to seeing you guys all again at our next growth talk and uh, enjoy your day wherever in the world you might be. Thank you all very much. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.